I'm going to talk here about uh, this algorithm called belief propagation and some aspect of it that people have been studying for, for many decades and some maybe new twists that uh, are related to theoretical computer science. So I'm going to, to start talking about the generative process and it's going to be a generative process on a tree. It's a, a probabilistic process. So you, you are given a tree, in this case this tree, my tree starts from the top and go to the bottom. And you know, I'm going to generate the coloring of the tree and the coloring is going to be in the following way. There are going to be Q colors. I'm going to choose the color of the root uniformly at random. And then for each edge between a parent and a child, I'm going to copy the color with probability theta. So I'm going to toss a coin with probability theta. It's going to tell me to copy. And otherwise, I'm going to choose a uniformly chosen color from one of the Q colors. OK, so I'm doing it for one layer. Maybe my theta is pretty high. So I copied, copied, copied. And maybe the last one I actually randomized. So maybe the last one I randomized over there. But when I randomized, I got the red, right? So that's the process that I'm doing. I'm doing it again and again and again. Okay. So that's the process that I'm going to talk about. Good, simple process. So let me jump straight into the machine learning. Infer, infer, here's an inference problem, problem. I want to infer the color of the root uh, from the color of the leaves. I only see the leaves, and I want to infer the color of the root. So this is the inference problem. And you know we can end the talk here. The answer is, if you just think about it a little bit, you cannot infer the color of the root. Why can't you infer the color of the root? Because this model, as, as, I, as I specified it, even if the root is red, there's some probability that all the children are going to be blue, and therefore below that, all the information will die. So it's not a situation that I can make probabil high probability statements, that I know the color is for sure, almost for sure, a specific color. Okay, so let's ask a more refined question. How much can we say about the color of the root from the color of the leaves? So here's the machine learning uh, perspective, if you want, very fast. So if you really don't think about theory too much, you look at this problem and you say, this problem is very easy. Why is it very easy? We cannot compute the color of the root. We cannot know what the color of the root is, as we said, information theoretically. But we can compute the posterior distribution on the root. We can, I can tell you, given the colors of the leaf, the probability that the root is red or blue or any of the colors, I can tell you exactly what these numbers are. And in fact, there's a very fast linear time algorithm called belief propagation for calculating this probability. Okay. Raise your left hand if you've seen belief propagation. OK, most of the people raise the, the left hand. Very good, OK? Uh, so belief propagation, for those of you who haven't seen it, you know, another variant of this you might have seen in your undergrad cl uh, classes is just dynamic programming, right? So there's a dynamic programming algorithm for recursively calculating the posterior probabilities uh, given the leaves. And belief propagation is actually famous mostly for its used on, use on general graphs, not just on trees. And the application for trees were known in many of the applications areas earlier. The earliest reference I found from biology and physics are, physics are from the 70s, right? But there might have been even earlier references. OK. So this is what this is sort of the, the trivial way of thinking about it. What we will want to know, we will want to study this problem sort of more asymptotically. You know, we we'll want to ask what happens when the tree is becoming larger and larger, and what can we say about this belief propagation or about other algorithms. And somehow, uh, I decided to break these talks into two parts. One of them I'm going to call linear theory. And linear theory corresponds to the case that Q is equal to 2, right? So physicists really have this obsession with Q. If you ever hear a physicist talk about POTS model, there will be the Q state POTS model. And then they will tell you, oh, listen, three and four are, one, two, three, and four are really different than five, six, seven, and eight. So I'm going to be a little bit like that, right? So I'm going to talk about linear theory, which for me would just mean the case Q is equal to two. The theory will be theory. And then there will be a different theory for larger Q later. OK, so let's try, first of all, before we talk about computation, let's uh, talk about the information theory perspective. So let's fix the setting. We are just going to have a tree of h levels. The depth of the tree is going to be h. And each node is going to have d children. These are the two parameters. And xv is going to be the color of node v. And x naught is going to be the color of the root. OK, so what we wanted to ask before is how much can we say about the color of the root from the color of the leaves? In particular, can we analyze? So we know what's the optimal algorithm. We understand what it is, right? It's a very simple algorithm. The question we want to do is to analyze this algorithm. So what is there to analyze? The question what we want to ask is, does it make sense to apply this algorithm, or this algorithm is going to return garbage? It's going to return half-half in the case of blue and red. And maybe a more naive question is like, suppose somebody would wake you up in the middle of the night and we tell you, 
you know, we will kill your wife unless you tell us what's the color of the root. So, you know, maybe in the first moment you wake up, you don't say, okay, let me just compute belief propagation over here. You'll just say, okay, okay, what are the color of the, of the, of the leaves over here? You'll cut how many red, how many blue. If there are more red, you will say red. If there are more blue, you will say blue, right? This is your instinct, right? Before you start thinking about actually applying base rule over and over again. So another natural question is to ask, you know, I suppose you apply the simple algorithm, what do you get? Okay, and I, as I said, these questions originated in statistical physics where, you know, the Q equal 2 case corresponds to the Ising model, the larger Q case corresponds to the Potts model, and the tree, for some reason, they call the beta lattice. Okay, so let me start with the simple algorithm where we just count. So we, I, I won't really go over the mass too carefully, but, you know, you look at the sum S of H, which is the sum of all of the leaves, the sum of the colors of all the leaves. I call, say, blue minus 1, and red one, suppose I'm a Trump supporter, that's what I do, right? So blue is minus one, red is one. Okay, so now I, I look at this estimator, which is the sum of all the colors. And then you do, if you took the probabilistic method, what do you do? You do first moment and you do second moment. You do the first moment and the second moment. And you do some computation. And it turns out there's some magical number that tells you the following. If you look at a very, very deep tree, the D is fixed, H is going to infinity, and you want to know, is this estimator, which is the sum of all of the leaves, correlated with the root or not? You will see that it is correlated if this parameter d, which is how many children each node has, times the parameter theta squared, theta is the copying probability, is greater than 1. Otherwise, when you do the first and second moment, it doesn't work. Okay, so that's what you get. And in fact, people in probability could do that much, much earlier. And Keston and Stigl, in a famous paper, famous today, nobody read this paper for 20 years from 66 to 86 or to the 90s, but in a famous paper today in 66, they actually computed, they grinded through the Fourier transform of this. It's a very hard to read paper, very smart people. And they proved a much stronger statement. They proved that if d, th d theta square is less or equal than 1, and you look at the sum, the sum is a normal random variable, which people in statistics and probability like. And this normal random variable is completely independent of the root. And if d theta square is back, greater than 1, then the sum converges under appropriate normalization to a non-normal law that is dependent on the root. Okay, so we understand more or less what happens if we just look at the, at the sum of the leaves. Makes us happy. Sounds very statistical. There will be computational uh, aspects soon. And d theta, uh, d theta square equal to 1 is, co is called the uh, keston stigum bound. And let me mention that this computation is true for every q. So in our mind, we just talked about q is equal to, but in fact, this, this keston stigum computation holds for every q. Okay, a more striking theorem, which will lead us to where we want to go, is that in fact, this is tight in some sense, in the case that q is equal to 2. So just in the case where q is equal to 2, this, this case that q is equal to 2 in, in this linear theory, if theta, theta square is less or equal than 1, then in fact, even if you apply the optimal information theoretical al algorithm, which is belief propagation, the number of layers is going to go higher and higher. Eventually, your posterior is going to be half-half with high probability. Okay, so you're going to run this sophisticated algorithm. There are going to be many levels. What are you going to do to get? You're going to get the answer, I don't know. You're going to get something that I don't know, right? So why, why is that making us happy? It means that in the asymptotic sense where H goes to infinity, this sophisticated nonlinear belief propagation algorithm infers non-trivially if and only if the trivial algorithm, which, be, which is majority, infers non-trivially, right? So there's really no difference between applying the sophisticated algorithm and the simple algorithm. And, you know, this is a big theory. I mean, I'm mentioning some names here. There's uh, Blecher, who is in Z Zagrebnov in the statistical physics theory, uh, Dimayaf from the Technion. I learned, learned, learned about this from Yuval Peres in this paper, Evans, Kenyon, Peres, and Schulman, and so on and so forth. There are now many proofs of this, of this fact. This theorem is non-trivial. It's now very popular in, in information theory. Yuri Polyansky has a bunch of information theory proofs of that. So, you know, this is a, became a very very active area in inf information theory and some generalization. All of the proofs use some concavity of some function. Okay, I won't tell you what is the function and what is the concavity, but if you look at the case uh, q equal 2, you are smart enough, you come up with this brilliant function, you are conjectured that is going to be concave, you are going to fail x number of times, where x is finite, and then the function is going to be concave, and you're going to be happy, right? So that's what happened here. Okay. Then you try it for larger q, and you fail again and again and again, and we'll see why in a little bit. We're good? This is sort of the background where we want to go. Good. So, uh, I w yeah? So do you claim that uh, the actual sequence of colors doesn't give you any additional information 
compared to just uh, counting how many are uh, halal Right, so good. This is a, uh, this is a fine. Some intermediate uh, values, not when h goes to infinity, but uh, for intermediate uh, h, right. it might be that one of them will not give you information, and the other will. Right, so belief propagation is always optimal, and belief propagation will always give you better probability of prediction, and we know how to quantify this, okay? But I don't want to talk about it for now, maybe we'll talk about it in, the, in a little bit. Right? So this is a very good question, right? We are just asking if the, is, does the inf amount of inf inf information goes to zero, or is it not going to zero? But it is always true that belief information gets you, gets you more information. In fact, if I get to the circuit complexity part of this talk, we'll get to this point. Uh, good. Other questions? Okay, so since this is the end of the day and I asked to turn off the air conditioning and everybody is trying to fall asleep, I wanted to tell you about two applications of this theory. Raise your ra and one of them is older and one of them is newer. So how many of you want to hear about phylogeny, which is something in biology, inference? That's one option. You can, you can raise both ends, actually, okay? And how many of you want to hear about partition of graphs, which is called the block model? Okay, so... I will. That was, my pre that was my prediction, by the way, okay. So, phylogy is fascinating, okay? There are beautiful pictures. Here's the theorem. What the theorem says, without going into detail, I'll just tell you what the theorem says. The theorem says that, you know, in, in the case of phylogeny, again, I'm looking at only in the case that Q is equal to, which people in biology actually consider. This is sort of a binary DNA. There's only two letters. Usually the two, letter, two, two letters would be A, C would be one letter, and G and T together would be, the other group would be the other letter. And D, you remember there was this parameter D of how many children each node has. In biology, usually the assumption is that D is equal to two, just for biological reasons. So D is equal to two, and Q is equal to two. So the threshold that we expect is two theta square equal to one. And somehow this happens to be the first transition for this phylogenetic reconstruction problem, which I didn't define. But sort of what it says that if the mutation rate is very high, which means that two theta square is less than one, then the amount of information on the lens of DNA sequences that you need information theoretically in order to recover the tree is polynomial. Well, if it's small, and exactly at the first transition, two theta square is bigger than one, the mutation parameter is small, then logarithmic is enough. Okay, so somehow this phase transition we see it, you know, this corresponds to this linear theory, just the, the summary of what happens here. Questions? Let's talk about the graphs. I'll tell you about the graphs. Okay, so here's a random graph model. This is called the block model. It's a random graph on, on uh, n nodes, and n is even, say, and half are red and half are blue. Q is two, right, so we can do that. And there's some weird parameterization here. I'm going to connect two nodes of the same color with some probability, which is 2D theta over n, and so on and so forth, and two nodes with different colors with a different probability. Why did I choose these two probabilities? I chose them in a way that the average degree is D, Okay, so we, wanted the, we want the average degree to be some number, so that's what I do. And I want it to be that the theta is the same theta that we had that before, such that if u and v are neighbors, the probability that the color of u is equal to the color of v is the same as in the tree process. So it's going to be the expected value of x u, which is plus minus one, x v, which is plus minus one, is going to be theta, which is exactly the same theta that we saw at the tree. That's the reason I chose this parameter. And now, the inference problem that we're going to be interested in, I'm going to give you an instant of the graph, no colors whatsoever, and I'm going to ask you which are red and which are blue. Very good. Can you solve this problem? So max cut is an option, is a suggestion, right? If you find a good cut, that sounds like a, a good suggestion. So it turns out good. So I didn't plan to talk about this, but it turns out that max cut is what's called the maximum likelihood solution for this problem. And the maximum likelihood solution is not the one that maximizes your objective function. Okay, so that's something that you can do, but in fact, it will not give you the right phase transition. I wanted to ask a more naive question, which I'll just, uh, maybe I'll just say it right now. The blue and the red are completely symmetric. So obviously, I cannot, you cannot tell me which are blue and which are red. You can tell me this is one class and this is the other class, right? You will not be able to tell me which one is which. But that's what we want to do. We want to know which is one class and which is the other class. And uh, what got me into this business is this conjecture of my friend from statistical physics, uh, uh, Kazakala, Moore, and Zdeberova, and the student the cell, that belief propagation is the optimal algorithm for solving this problem, and you can find a non-trivial partition if and only if d theta square greater than one. So I like this d theta square equal to one. I saw this conjecture. I said, this is amazing. Okay, we have to understand what's going on here. Okay, so let's see what the picture is here. Yeah. Yeah, so it depends, actually, it depends. Theta can, 
yeah, there's also a, there's, there's two versions of this model. There's also a, a, a version where you are less likely to connect to the person in the same cluster, so it can either max cut or min cut would be the right algorithm. Was that the question? Okay. Good. Uh, good. So let me just show, just in case, you know, to clarify exactly the model. So this is the sample from the model, right? So this is the graph. This is some blue, some are, some are blue, some are red. What is the data that you get as a statistician? Say the data that you get is this data. You get exactly the same picture, but without the colors. And your goal is to find, well, this is too much. We know that we cannot really find that, but maybe we can find something close to that, right? That's our goal. Very good? Okay. So I'm going to two, prove two theorems. Since it's the end of the day, it's going to be like that. I'm going to move my hands a lot, and maybe you'll be confused. Uh, maybe we'll be convinced. We'll see. Okay, so when we first heard about this, this uh, conjecture, we were super excited. And one thing, one thing that you know wasn't too hard to prove is that indeed, if d theta squared is less or equal than one, then it's impossible. And by impossible, I mean information theoretically impossible. Impossible to infer better than random. I cannot really infer more than 50% of the nodes correctly. Okay, so let, let me show you the proof of that. I'm just going to show you two easy proofs. Okay, so you have to think about this question about partition, right? I have to know which is one side of the partition, which is the other side of the partition. I know that there's a symmetry between blue and red, so it's, there's an easy reduction to the following problem. There are two nodes that are green. I don't know if you see them. There's one green node here and one green node there. So I choose two random nodes. You can convince yourself that if you can partition better than random, then you can do better than random in deciding if these two random nodes have the same color or a different color. Okay, so you know, we are just going to be interested in this easier task of just deciding if two random nodes are of the same color or different color. So these are these two random nodes that I chose. And you know, because of symmetry, I might as well assume that this node is red, right? So I know that this node is red. The other one, I don't know what the color is, so I want to know if it's if red or blue. So I really want my tree, so I'm just going to put my tree there. So here's my tree. I look at this graph, and if you think about this graph, this graph is locally like a random tree, right? You know, we know that random graphs tend to look like trees, so it's locally like a random tree. And if you think about the distribution of the colors of this on this tree, the distribution of the colors is exactly the process on the tree that I described to you before. I copy with probability theta, and otherwise I randomize. Okay? And now you say, well, you know, given the information that I have at the leaves, suppose this is not just two levels or three levels, this is many levels, do I really, does this guy really help me? Then you say, well, it should be that given the leaves, the node here at the bottom is conditionally independent from the node at the center. So this is called the Markov random field property. In fact, it's not trivial that the Markov random field property holds here, but you can prove that it does hold, or approximately hold. It seems it's approximately hold. You actually don't need this guy. And then you just go back to the question, given that I gave you this extra information, which is the color of the leaves of the tree, where I go for many generations, can I infer the root? And I know that you cannot infer the root if d theta squared is less or equal than 1 when q is equal to. Everything is in the linear theory. Every, Everybody is okay with my hand waving? Okay, so that's the, that's the argument for this. The most striking part of the conjecture is the following part, which I'm, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about, is the part that belief propagation is the optimal algorithm. This actually we do, still don't know how to prove and that the first transition is uh, this d theta square equal to 1. So we already saw that we can only solve up to a global flip, and we know that the graph is very sparse, so we cannot hope to recover all of the nodes. There are many nodes of degree 1 or 2, which you cannot re recover exactly, obviously. So one of the things that got me very annoyed about this is when I talked about belief propagation on the tree, this is some recursive algorithm, which if you've seen before, you know what it does, and if you don't, you don't. But you initialize it by the actual color at the leaves. When we talk about belief propagation on the graph, what do I initialize by? Because I don't know any colors. Okay? So if you initialize in a principled way, the right initialization would be to say that every node is red with probability a half and blue with probability half. That's the right way to initialize. If you want belief propagation with this initialization, you will realize that in the next iteration, every node will also be with probability half red and with probability half blue. So something is fishy here, right? You know, if you apply the algorithm like you should, you get a trivial answer. And instead, the physicists are, of course, very smart, and they thought about it. They are not going to initialize this way. The way they're going to initialize is in a different way. The way they're going to initialize is they're going to say, well, we're just going to toss a completely independent coin and color half of the nodes blue and half of the nodes red, and then we're going to run belief propagation. Small number of nodes will be 
you can also do that randomly, and that would also work. Okay, but you know the question is why you know what does it mean, right? It doesn't really fit our understanding of belief propagation as somebody that computes posterior probability. Why does it have to be a randomized algorithm, right? And you know that's led us or me to think about what is actually happening here. And then maybe the question for you for later in the afternoon. What algorithm that you know that, you know, this, these are French people who do statistical physics, so I had to put a cheese picture here. What other algorithm that you know that, you know, you put garbage here, you know, you do something and you get cheese. Oh, no. So now you tell me that these are cows. So cows are not a legitimate answer here, right? So, you know, what algorithm that, you know, when you start with garbage, you want something over and over again and you get something meaningful. Anybody? Okay, so the algorithm that I know that does that is a linear algebra or numerical linear algebra algorithm for computing the leading eigenvector of a matrix. What's the easy, you know, when you learn linear algebra, numerical linear algebra, how do you compute the leading eigenvector of a matrix? Start from a random vector, you apply the matrix over and over again, and you're going to converge to the leading eigenvector, okay? And then this led us to this work with the physicists to understand if this is also what's happening here, and it does, so there was a work, uh, Everything that I'm talking about in this work is with uh, Joe Neiman and Alan Sly, and in this part there was also independent work by Laurent Massoulet that actually showed that if data, d theta square is greater than, that, than one, then it's possible to detect. So I'm just going to give you a hint of why this is true. And what happened is it turned out that it is a linear algebra algorithm, but it is a linear algebra al algorithm not with the agency matrix of the graph, but with this following stretch matrix. So here's the matrix. The original graph is n, is of size, has an n node, so it's of size n by n matrix. Here we have a 2n by 2n matrix, and this 2n by 2n matrix has one block, which is my original matrix A, the GSC matrix of the graph. It has zero. Okay, zero we don't care about. It has minus the identity here, and here it has a matrix which has the degree minus one. Diagonal matrix where the ith entry is the degree minus one. And if you look at this matrix, you look at the leading eigen, the, actually the second eigenvector of this matrix, the second eigenvector of this matrix is correlated with the partition. Okay, so now this is proven. And the question is, where will you come up with, from this matrix, right? So this matrix doesn't sound, you know, it's, it's not the first matrix that you're going to try, right? People in, in uh, spectral graph theory try a lot of matrices. They particular like symmetric matrices or normal matrices, this is not a normal matrix, the spectrum is complex, where will you come up with this matrix? Where would, this, would it come from? And the answer is that this actually comes from linearizing belief propagation. Okay, so what is belief propagation? Belief propagation is, a, when you think about it as a graph, is an algorithm that takes probabilities to probabilities. You think about it as an operator. What we said before, this operator has a trivial fixed point, which is all one half. You look at this operator, you linearize it around the one-half, one-half point. Then you get some operator which is not as simple as that, but look a little bit like that. You apply some linear algebra slash number theory identities by Hashimoto, and you get this matrix over here. Okay? So the reason we got this matrix is because we knew that belief propagation works in practice, and because we knew the physicists told us this is the optimal algorithm, we can, still can't prove much about belief propagation. Instead of working with belief propagation, we took this linear algebra intuition, we linearized this operator, we got this matrix, and for this we can actually prove stuff. The proofs are not easy, but we can prove it. You're good? So that's one little story from the linear theory. I keep using the word linear all the time, right? You notice I linearize, uh, uh, there's something linear happening here. And I'll just, I'll just show you, I'll just show you a picture. I mean, if you, if you take a random graph from this model, this is how the spectrum looks like, right? So usually when we look at spectrum of matrices, we, we are not used to this two-dimensional picture, but here, this is really not a normal matrix. So the, 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 the spectrum is complex. And these two eigenvectors, this is what we expect. This is what corresponds to the average degree. And the second eigenvalue here corresponds to the structure that we've seen to the two communities. Okay, and if you work with physicists, yeah, so this is a joint work of, uh, with Neumann, Sly, and, uh, Sly and, and the group of physicists. And what's nice about physicists is they know how to program. So once you know how to do stuff, they like immediately run it on a bunch of real network. And then they claim that in many of these network, actually, the number of real eigenvalues outside uh, the, this disk of radius square root d correspond to the number of communities or the number of communities that you have in the data, right? So, you know, it seems like, you know, there's really something interesting going on. 
Good. Questions? Questions about this linear theory? Uh, we know a bunch of stuff, but by and large, we don't understand the spectral distribution, right? So we understand a lot of a lot of the we understand what, what's the, where the zero is coming from and the multiplicity of the zero. We understand the one and the minus one and multiplicities of this, but we don't really understand the asymptotic uh, distribution of the of the eigenvalues inside of this. Second, yeah. right? I and minus i are similar actually to the one and minus one. We also under, this has to do with cycles in the graph. That's something that we understand pretty well. So it is related to non-backtracking random walk where you see a similar picture, right? So, good. <laughs> Maybe two more questions. Yes, first in the back. Yeah. Right. So this, this, this. Uh, very good. So you're, you're encouraged to look at at, at at our paper in PNAS. It's just a linear algebra fact that you know there's n and m. So let's call the number of edges m. So the belief propagation indeed is an n by n matrix, and somehow I reduce it to two n by two n matrix, and this has, some, has to do with some generous. Uh, there's something that generate about the n by n matrix, right? So you know this is the this uh, realization in the context of non-backtracking random walk, or already Hashimoto when we talked about zeta 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 functions for graph. That the real dimension is not is you can uh, uh, capture everything in 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 two n. You don't need this n. So I, I, went, I went over this very quickly, but I think I don't want to spend it five minutes maybe for the calculation. It's really a signal versus noise calculation. So if you really want to do it, the easiest way to get the intuition is to do this. You just think about signal versus noise. You look at the expected value of the sum. You look at the variance of the sum. And then, you know, and this will give you the basic intuition. Right? So I won't do the calculation right now. But if you do that, that, that should give you the, the intuition. Good. Good. Uh, good, so let me tell you about the nonlinear theory, right? So uh, since I'm not a physicist and I can't make prediction, I can only I make some prediction, but I prove theorems, I'm not going to actually commit that the linear theory is Q equal 2, th two and 3 and sometimes 4, which it is, and the nonlinear theory is Q going 5 and higher, which it is. I'm just going to prove stuff, so I'm going to assume Q is large enough, right? So everything I'm going to say, no, Q is going to be large enough. Okay, so first of all, there's good news about the large Q. Everything that you knew for the small q, you also know for the large q, for q equal 2. So here's the claim for all q if d theta square is greater than 1. For the three broadcast process, we can asymptotically distinguish the root. We can detect in the block model better than random. And we can re recover phylogeny from sequences of order length n, of order log n. Okay, so everything that we can do before, we can do now with this parameterization. And I just give you the proof in an easy case where q is even. So this is the proof where, where Q is even. It's one line proof. Q is 200 million. So I have 200 million color. I'm going to call 100 million of them plus, 100 million of them minus. I think what happens to the three broadcast process or to the broadcast process from plus and minus, I'm going to copy this probability data. I'm going to randomize otherwise. Everything that I knew before, I can do now just by this trivial reduction. OK, so what I told you right now is true. But it's a little unsettling because, you know, somehow I threw a lot of information away and I did it in a very arbitrary fashion, right? There was nothing smart about the way I did it, which indicates that, you know, there's something more interesting going on, which we'll get to in the next slide. If Q is really large, then the partition, even when it's uh, odd, uh, almost equally. Almost equally. Almost equally. equally. You lose a little bit, but maybe we don't do that. Instead, we'll actually repeat the proofs of all of the theorems. So actually, we know something much more general. I just wanted to give you the easy proof. But we know something much more general for any Markov process that tells you how to copy from parent to child. It doesn't have to be just, just copy with probability theta and randomize. Otherwise, you have a matrix that tells you how you go, a channel that tells you how you go from a parent to a child. You can look at the second eigenvalue of the matrix. You call it this theta. And you do every, every proof that you did before, you can do now. It's a little bit more messy, and you get the same result. If d theta square is bigger than 1, whatever you could do before, you can do now in this more general setup. So you don't have to even lose anything. Right? I just wanted to give you the easy proof of the intuition. Good. So OK, like I said, but the trivial, algor uh, tri trivial argument I gave you, the, the goal of it to say there's something ridiculous here. I'm throwing so much information away, it means that you know, th there may be smarter, something smarter I can do. OK, so here I maybe so I have 
all these quantifiers here, maybe I should have written it differently, but the statement is the following. For a large Q, there exists some other theta Q, which is, satisfies not d theta square equal to one, but d theta square is less than one, such that for all theta greater than theta Q, you can do whatever you did before. You can distinguish the, the color of the wood better than random, you can detect in the block model, and you can recover phylogeny from sequences of length order log n. Okay, so you can go a little bit below, and you see I, I kept a lot of space there, and the space is because something nonlinear is happening, but you cannot do it using linear or robust estimator. So if you want to infer the color of the root, just counting won't help you. You know, you, this works for d theta square equal to one, you cannot go below that. If you want robust algorithms, so robust may be similar to a detox, maybe even randomly robust. I apply a little bit of noise of, on each of the leaves, the algorithms that I have right now, belief propagation is not going to work anymore, right? So there's something fragile happening here. You can detect in the block model, so there was a large work on the, on the block model, including the original paper, all of this large sequence of work had, have the conjecture that once you go below d theta square less than, uh, d, d theta square equal to one, you cannot do it in polynomial time. So of course, this is just a conjecture. It's an average case problem, where the conjecture is that you, once d theta square is, is less than one, you cannot do it in polynomial, polynomial time, even though information theoretically it is possible. Okay, so we know it is information theoretically possible. We know that all, all the algorithms that people designed, including SDPs, uh, message passing, and so on and so forth, we cannot analyze them be below this d theta square equal to one. And similarly, for phylogeny, we believe that it cannot be done robustly. Okay, so something more interesting happened in this nonlinear uh, story. And I'll try, to, of course, it's more interesting, so I'll just try to tell you a, a little bit about it, not too much. Maybe I'll just prove. I'll prove to you one more easy theorem, and that's the last thing I'm going to prove. So just ignore the first theorem, I'm, ignore the sec I'm going to prove to you the second theorem. So what does the second theorem say? So remember there's D, there's theta, D is how many children each node has. Theta is the copying probability, and Q is the number of colors. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix D and theta, and I'm going to take Q very large. So here's the statement. If D theta, not square, if D theta is greater than one, it's outer square, then for Q bigger than Q large enough, we can distinguish the root better than random. Okay, so you don't need D theta square to be bigger, bigger than one, it's enough that D theta is bigger than one. And I'm going to prove this theorem to you now, but I'm going to prove it for large Q. What's the largest number you know? Infinity, very good. I'm, I'm going to prove it for Q equal infinity. Okay, so what is Q equal infinity? Can anybody tell me what is the model for Q equal infinity? No, no, that is a good suggestion, but that's not going to be my model. So if you had to come up with the model where I copy this probability theta and otherwise I randomize, what does it mean to randomize a more infinitely many colors? I get a new color, I introduce a new color that I've never seen before. So again, the model for Q equal to infinity, start from some color, it doesn't have to be numbered in any way. I copy this probability theta. If I don't copy, I put a new color that I've never seen before. Okay, so that's the model. So here's my model, I'm just going to draw the edges where I copy. So I copy here, I copied here, here I randomized, here I copied, here I copied, here I copied, here I copy, here I randomized, here I randomized, here I randomized, here I copied, here I copied. Okay, can anybody give me an algorithm for recovering the root given the leaves? Yeah, you have to copy the same, so you want to the same color. Let's be a little careful. So let's look at this picture. Okay, let me add another layer here just that we know that happens here. So these two nodes have the same color, but I randomized here. Okay, so it doesn't give me the color of the root. What you need, very good, what you need is I need two nodes, one in the left subtree and one in the right subtree that have the same color. If I have one in the left subtree and one in the right subtree that have the same color, then the root necessarily has to be the same color. Okay, where does this d theta greater than one come from? Well, in Q is equal to infinity, I copy this probability theta. This is just what's called the branching process, right? I, you know, we have a tree and it's going. If d theta is greater than one, we know that in this subtree with positive probability, there's going to be a node connected to this guy. And in this subtree with some positive probability, there's going to be a guy connected to this one. So that's actually the proof for Q equal infinity. We just did the proof for Q equal infinity. How you do large finite Q? Well, if you know your branching process well enough, you do the same thing, right? Which is a little harder, but you do the same thing. We're good? Okay. But this already, so maybe, still let me tell you a little bit about large Q. 
So what you'll do for large Q, you won't just look for one node here and one node here. Sort of what comes in the proof is you look for something fractal. So I'm going to look for one node here and one node here, maybe two cousins that have the same color. And then I'm going to sort of deduce that this is the same color. And then I, I will hope that these two guys are cousins too. So I'm going to look so for some fractal structure in the leaves of the tree that percolates all the way to the root. And if I find this uh, fractal structure, I'm going to declare that's the root and otherwise not. And you can analyze and you can show that for large enough Q, this actually works. So there's different results. There's actually better algorithms than this algorithm, depending on what you want to do. I just wanted to give you the intuition of what, what's happening here. Good. Right, so D theta square, uh, the question that was asked before is coming from this noise, uh, this, this signal versus noise cal calculation, this, this variant. And D theta, my best intuition is actually coming from this Q equal infinity case. And it's just really a question about the branching process. Because I want this copying process to survive, and I want this copying process to survive. So there's no noise, right? So you have to formalize it in the case that Q is large, that you can overcome the little bit of noise that there is. And the issue is that it's not, again, a question of counting and signal versus noise. It's a much more delicate question about you know, finding this very, very small in terms of number, but structure, structures, right? So there's a structure here. The number of guys of the same color is going to be tiny. It's going to be less than square root of the level, but they're going to be in the right place somehow. So, I mean, a lot is known. Five is the critical value, but just only when the degrees are, I mean, there's some, there's a bunch of results, but we don't have the full picture. Already for Q equal five, you know that you can get below D theta square is equal to one. But in, in some regime of the parameters, right? So we don't understand all of the regimes of the parameters, but in some regimes of the parameters. Yeah. So you're saying something about this being computationally high. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to oh. get there. Yeah, so I mean, hopefully I'm going to get there. That's, that's my goal in this case. <laughs> Okay, so let's, good. So now I want to talk a little bit about the complexity of BP, right? So I mean, right, some of BP succeeded to do that. It succeeded to detect, de detect this fractal structure over here. It didn't just count, you know, this very tiny fractal structure, it succeeded to detect it. So is there something complex that's going on in BP? So, okay, the first answer is that, is BP complex? No, it runs in linear time, so it's not complex. But, you know, when you think about it a little bit, there's two uh, annoying things about it. it. Maybe the most important thing is that it uses depth. It's a recursive algorithm. And, you know, unlike all the other uh, machine learning talks, I'm maybe also going to talk about deep learning. Okay, so there's depth here, right? <laughs> and it also uses real numbers, which is also a little annoying. Why do you have to reuse real numbers? This, there's just these 10 colors here. You know, why do I have to reuse probability in order to get what I get? So maybe this algorithm is, is complex. I'm, I'm going to try to address these two questions uh, in, in next. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to have, this, this person is a very good instinct. Whenever I hear deep learning, I also immediately escape the room. You know, that's a very good instinct. So he escaped just in the right moment. But uh, I, st I still want to say that, I mean, this is my perspective about maybe where one, one case where the, uh, the, 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 the theory community can do something about deep inference. And this is sort of my uh, holy grail for what do we need to do about, uh, about deep learning. So I think what we want to do abstractly, forget about the deepness and about backpropagation and about random initialization. If we want to think about it from far away or the way I think about it from far away, what I want is I want a model with three uh, objectives. I want the model to be somewhat realistic. You know, it has to describe data that looks like data that people care about. I want us the theorists to prove that we can recover the model, right? This, the same way that people build deep nets. I want to show that if you're given samples from the data, you, 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 can, you can get the deep net and you can do inference with it. And finally, I want to prove that you need depth for this model, right? It's not some model I described that has a lot of depth, but in fact, it's regression. You know, I just counting, I count with a tree of ad addition, right? That's stupid, right? I want to prove that you need depth for it. And one of the reasons I talked to you about this podcast process is at least two of these properties we already have. I, this model of the broadcast on the trees, you know, I didn't invent it. People use it in physics, people use it in biology. You know, it's a reasonable, somewhat realistic model. Reconstruction is what you all decided not to hear about, which is phylogenetic reconstruction. So we have reconstruction algorithm from the models. If we have a lot of data points from this model, we can actually reconstruct this, this model. Maybe the third question is depth. You know, do you really need depth for, this, for, this, for doing this inference? Do you really need depth for BP? Okay? So for me, this is one example. I mean, of course, it's, in terms of realism, it's weak compared to the applications because the real applications are for vision and speech. 
and you know, this is some hierarchical model which vision and speech may have this feature of being hierarchical, but they have many other features, right? So that's not enough, right? So we need more in order to, to talk about that, but I think it's at least realistic for some data. Okay, so what we're going to talk about now is, this is my one slide about deep influence. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, uh, depth lower bound. Okay, and the size, maybe I, I should say what n is. I didn't say n is going to be the number of leaves now. Okay, so the tree is going to go exponentially, n is going to be the number of leaves. And the generative model is depth uh, order log n, so we cannot expect better than order log n lower bounds in terms of depth, right? That's the best that we can hope for. Obviously, even this is very hard if we know computational complexity. And you know, okay, this is some sizes of deep nets. They're becoming deeper and deeper. The main thing is that we are going to discuss some recent depth lower bounds for this model which are joined with Ankur Moitra and, and Colin Sandon. Okay, good. Left hand was practiced enough. Who didn't, who knows what AC0, raise your right hand? Oh, very good. Wow, that's a great crowd. Uh, so AC0 is the class of uh, bounded depth circuits with end on R gates. And I'm going to start telling you what we know about belief propagation in the context of uh, circuit classes. So the first theorem that we can do is we can prove the following. AC0 applied to the labels of the leaves on the tree, no matter which model, no matter which Q, cannot classify better than random. Okay, so if you just look at AC0, bounded depths, and then also you cannot do it better than random. And it's, maybe it's trivial, I think it's sort of trivial, but maybe it's not so trivial because actually one thing that we do prove in the other direction is that AC0 can generate the leaf distribution. So the process going this way, you can do with AC0, but the process going that way, you cannot do in AC0. So we know for this phenomena for major. We know it for other cases, right? So if you, you've seen uh, you've, you've seen circuit complexity, this phenomena occurred for other for other uh, uh, settings. Maybe this is a very most natural data setting that I've seen. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's. Uh, but you are. Sorry. Okay, let's go to it. I'm not going to prove anything in, in this in this part of the talk. Let's go to the next level. So AC0 doesn't do anything. A very interesting class is TC0. So TC0 is AC0 but with majority gates. And majority is a little bit like ReLUs, right? You can sum stuff and it doesn't cost you. You can sum a bunch of numbers and you, you, know, you can get the sign. It's not really round. It's not really ReLU, right? It's like the derivative of ReLU if you want, but it's, it's going in the direction of ReLUs. And if you want the one way to think about it when the inputs are binary, this is some version of bounded uh, depths deep nets. And here, maybe an answer to Adil's question, when Q is equal to two in the linear theory and theta is large enough, but not one, like theta is bigger than 0 0.99999, it's actually a function of D, but let's say 0 0.9999 even for D equal to, TC0 can classify as well as BP. So by this I mean it's not only has the same phase transition, the accuracy of getting the right answer on average is the same. Okay. So in the linear theory case, in the case that Q is equal to 2, there's some indication here that the class TC0, which is a bounded depth class, but with majority gates, can do as, 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 as well as BP. And our conjecture in the paper, and it's based on previous conjectures that are somehow coming to the proof, that this is true for all theta when we just have Q is equal to 2 in the linear theory case. Okay, what's the algorithm? Very good. The algorithm is actually very simple. Uh, the algorithm is very simple. What I'm going to do, because I'm in TC0, I can approximate a belief propagation for a constant number of layers. So I'm going to be constant. This is going to be constant number of layers. And here I'm going to be BP on my inputs. And for the rest, I'm going to do majority. This is just going to, to, put the, to be majority of all of the sleeves. This is going to be majority of all of the sleeves, and so on and so forth. Okay? So I'm going to take majority over subtrees. And majority over subtrees is going to give me some noisy information here. And then I'm going to apply BP. What's the technical difficulty in the proof? The technical difficulty in the proof is to show that if you apply BP to noisy inputs, these are not the real guys here, they're just correlated with them, you get the same accuracy as if you applied it to the real inputs. Okay? And this is not an easy proof, it's actually done in another paper, it's a 50 page proof to prove this for a data between 0 0.9999 and 1. And if you want to prove it for data all the way to the critical value, we do not, we do not know how to do that. Okay, so that's, that's where the, what the proof is. Good. Okay, so this is still, it's not clear if we actually have depths or not. Uh, maybe we can classify in TC0. 
and maybe bounded depth uh, nets of files, and you know, some other theory people may argue that this is the case, Shai Shalev Schwarz, maybe, you know, some people may argue that maybe you need a fixed, but you know, large depth, that's enough. Let's go to the next class. So the next class is going to be NC1. I still going to be N and R, but now I can go to order log N depths. And let me just relate it to TC0. So TC0 is a subset in NC1, and it's an open problem if they're the same. And uh, one easy thing that you can ch check is that one can classify as well as BP in NC1. And this is what he said, you know, the generating process is, 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 uh, is uh, log n. Going back should also be log n. There's some issues with real numbers and truncating and so on and so forth, but you can do them. That's not too interesting. What's more interesting is that there is a broadcast process. So it's not of the form copy this probability data I randomize otherwise. It's a broadcast process that as a matrix of size three by three with some specific numbers, which I'm not, I don't remember and I'm not going to tell you. This is going to tell you what's the probability of copying from one layer to the next. All right, so before, our matrices were always of the form theta times the identity plus one minus theta times the matrix where all the entries were the same. Now I'm going to, instead of that, so that's not the matrix I'm going to look at, it's going to be some three by three matrix, which I don't remember. It's going to, be, to have some generic values this is going to tell you how I go from this level to this level. So there is a broadcast process on the tree for which classifying better than random is NC1 complete. Okay, so what's the indication here? So unless for these processes, uh, unless uh, TC0 is equal to NC1, log N depth is necessary. Okay, so that's the, the kind of statement that we can make. So let me try to connect it to this D theta square uh, greater than one. So in fact, if you look at this matrix, you remember theta was the second eigenvalue. And in this matrix, which is three by three or 16 by 16 or four by four, I don't remember what's the smallest uh, size we get it. In all of this example, the theta is equal to zero. Okay, so if you look at d theta square, no matter how large d is, it's, it's, it's zero. You know? so there's something algebraic or the, the generate about this example. Okay, so why am I telling you that? I'm telling you that because we've seen all, all, already all of that, but the, the brave conjecture that we made is that for any broadcast process below the Keston Stigon bound and where belief propagation classifies better than random, then classification is NC1 complete. Okay, so that's the, well, let me try to, exp maybe there's a lot of information here. So there's this Keston Stigon bound, which is d theta square. So maybe I'll, I'll draw the picture again. If d theta square is greater than one, we saw that many things are easy, in particular in, in the case of a block model. Uh, in, 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 in the case of block model, we saw that it's easy. In the case of phylogeny, we saw in this easy. In the case of circuit that we were talking about, now we saw that it's in TC0. If d theta square is less than one, and BP does better than random, which we've seen there are many example of, better than random guess, the conjecture is that this is a NC1 hard or complete. Okay, so that's the picture, right? So if this conjecture is true and all the indications that we have that this conjecture is true, there's sort of a nice relation here between some phase transition that come from physics and some computational complexity difficulty that, that we see in, in analyzing uh, this, this uh, belief propagation. Questions? Yeah. Right, so this was just Q equal infinity. If you wanted to go a little bit below infinity, then the algorithms that we know are like BP. They, are, they have recursive nature, right? So what's confusing about the case Q is equal to infinity is just, it's just really these two queries of finding two guys in the subtrees, which you can, you can do in a very small circuit, right? Maybe, but, uh, or very shallow, sh very shallow circuit, right? But if you look at Q is equal to one billion, I don't know how to do that, right? So yeah, that's a good question. Yeah? Is NC1 convenient to the worst case statement? Right, so, so, right, so sorry, all of this statement is for the average case. All the statement that I gave you about the AC, AC0, about the TC0, and about the NC1. We also have statement about uh, worst case, but I think these are less, less interesting. 
this is conjecture, but the example that I gave you was also an average case example, right? There's going to be one Markov chain. So if you want to do better than random in the sense that I generate randomly, the, I gener randomly generate the whole process, I apply my algorithm. I want to be able to infer overall in expectation better than random, then you, know, you, you can do it even only if it's, uh, you, you can, doing this better than random is NC1 complete. So it's only in the average sense over the generation of the data. But what, what would be average case here? Maybe that's what's confusing, right? So we usually, when we think about average case in, in many settings in theoretical computer science, we think about uniformly random input. The right way to think about it in our setup is I generate data for my process. I start from the root. I percolate down according to this process. Then I get some distribution. So that would be the natural distribution which respect I talk about average case. Does make sense? It's also, I mean, we have to get something average case, otherwise we won't be able to do that, right? Yeah. Then how do you define it? What is the NC1 average? No, the NC1 is just NC1, right? But there's these problems in NC1 about checking if a product of guy is the identity, which you can make random version of them, which are still NC1, right? So in NC1, there is this worst case to average case reductions, which are sort of known, okay? Good. It was, that was what was puzzling you, okay, good. Good, Quest other questions? Good. So let me mention just briefly this, uh, this question about real numbers versus not real numbers. So, and this is re re uh, related to, if you want, what are the memory requirements of BP? Do we really have to really work with real numbers? Is there a smarter way, we can, smarter thing that we can do that only uses bounded amount of memory per message? And the difference between this and the previous part, in the previous part are allowed arbitrary circuits. They did not have to confirm to the structure of the tree. Now I'm talking about algorithms that have exactly the structure of the tree. I pass messages from children to parents, and I ask, do I really have to pass messages that are real numbers, or can I pass much messages that are simpler somehow? And already in this paper from almost 20 years ago, there was this conjecture that uh, Evans, Kenyon, Paris, and Schulman, that for Q equal to any recursive algorithms on the tree, which uses at most B bits of memory per node, cannot achieve this kesten stigum bound. It works only below the kesten stigum bound with some dependency on how much memory it has. And you know, maybe I'll, I'll stop the talk because I'll stop here, but uh, you know, we proved that this is correct. This uh, joint work uh, with Vishesh Jain, uh, Freddy who is here somewhere, and, and Jig Bolu, we proved that this conjecture is true. And any bounded amount of bits is not enough. You actually have to use the infinite precisions if you want to get all the way to the threshold. Right, it has to go from the leaf upward and it has to confirm, right? So the only thing that you're allowed to design is I get one, ch suppose D is equal to two, I have two children. There's one information in one child, that's most B bits. One, and the second piece of information in another child, you can combine them in any way that you want, okay? And, and it produce B bits and do it over and over again, right? That's the only, the only th thing I'm allowing you, right? So I'm thinking about generalizing just rounding BP, right? But you are allowed to do it in a more, more general way. So again, uh, sorry, maybe let me t to say the, the order of quantifiers here. You fix D, okay? The real threshold for reconstruction is VP is D theta squared. How many bits of memory that you want? D is two. So no, so even if you have a billion bits, it's, you're not going to get to the same, th same threshold. You are going to get somewhat close to the threshold, but you're not going to get to the same threshold. You know, there's going to be some small interval where BP does better than random and your algorithm will just produce something that looks like random. Make sense? Good, so let me summarize maybe. So I, I promised to talk about simplicity and, co and uh, complexity. So BP is simple because it runs in linear time and above this kesten stigum bound, it behaves like a linear algorithm. It's complex because uh, it tends to be fractal uh, below the kesten stigum bound. There seems to be some statistical computational gaps and it seems to require depth and precision. Okay, thank you. <laughs>